Alright, so this is going to be a review of the material for the midterm exam for biological psychology at Mississippi State. So I have the study guide pulled up here from Canvas, but as you will see, I have tweaked it a little bit uh, in order to try to help you guys as much as possible in this review video. I went through and added a few notes of my own briefly before I started working on this video. So. The study guide that is posted has a particular topic for you to focus on from each chapter. There's going to be um, essentially six and a half chapters because we only do half of chapter 13, but um, seven chapters in total. But I only want you to focus on that one particular topic from each chapter. And for each one of these topics, I've made a few notes on the study guide for you guys. So the midterm exam is going to consist of 40 questions that are multiple choice and true false and then there will also be an essay question so there will actually be two essay questions and you'll choose which one you want to answer whichever one you feel most confident about. So as I said you only need to focus on the topics that are on the study guide. Having said that I may not mention every single aspect of each topic during this review video. I will cover as many as possible, but I still recommend that you go through and study your notes, and the textbook is a great resource if you have that as well. So for chapter one, I asked you to focus on research methods, and what I was thinking about when I said research methods was primarily the three types of research that we talked about. So we talked about correlational research and experiments, and for experiments we said that there were two types, behavioral interventions and somatic interventions, as far as we're concerned in biological psychology. So with correlational research, we are not manipulating anything. We are measuring two naturally occurring variables to see if there's a relationship between them. For example, I could measure your class attendance and I could measure your grades. I could look to see if there's a relationship between your class attendance and your grades. But that's correlational, not experimental, because I'm not doing anything to manipulate your class attendance or to manipulate your grades. I'm just looking for a relationship between them. Now, this relationship will have a strength and a direction. So, first of all, when it talks about the strength, this is the number that's associated with the correlation. So, the value, the number here, is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. So, a correlation of 0 means there's no relationship at all. A correlation of 1 means that there is a perfect relationship. Both of those are pretty rare. Normally, you're going to find something in between. So you might have a correlation of 0.7 or 0.8, something like that. Now, the closer the number is to 1, the higher the number, the stronger the correlation, and therefore the better the prediction. Like That's the purpose of correlational research, is to be able to make an informed prediction. So, uh, for example, a 0.7 correlation is stronger than a 0.4 correlation. The other thing to mention here is the direction. So correlations can be either positive or negative. A positive correlation means the two variables are moving in the same direction, which would be both up at the same time or both down at the same time. A negative correlation means they're moving in opposite directions. As one goes up, the other goes down. But one thing to note here is that the direction is not important for the strength. So a negative 0.9 correlation and a positive 0.9 correlation have the same strength because the number is the same, so the number determines the strength. Okay, now behavioral and somatic interventions are two types of experiments. They're experiments, which means they allow us to determine causation if we do a good job with them, which is not something we can do with correlational research. So what makes an experiment different is that it has independent and dependent variables. So the independent variable is the thing that you are manipulating, and then the dependent variable is the thing that you're measuring. So you want to see the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. So with a behavioral intervention, the independent variable is going to be something in the environment or something behavioral. The dependent variable will be biological. For example, I could put an individual in the presence of potential mating partners, and I could look to see how their hormonal levels change. So the thing that I manipulated might be that some people were put into a room with potential mates and other people were left alone or were put in a room with people that they don't find attractive. So I manipulated the environment that the person was in and then I measured their levels of certain hormones. I'm measuring something um, that is biological or somatic. So then with a the somatic intervention, we flip those, and our independent variable is biological, and our dependent variable is environmental or behavioral. So for example, I could take an individual and administer, um, some individuals could get the 
particular hormone like testosterone and other individuals could get nothing, placebo, something like that. So the independent variable is biological. We're administering a medication, a hormone. But then the dependent variable is behavioral. We might see if there is a difference in an individual's behavior towards potential mates depending on the uh, biological factor that was administered to them, whether that be the placebo or whether that be um, the hormone. So the major difference here with an experiment is we're actually manipulating something and that allows us to, if we're doing a good job, determine causation. Okay, chapter two, I asked you to focus on anatomy and physiology of neurons. So we talked in the beginning of chapter two about microanatomy and then later we talked about gross anatomy. So I'm not asking you to focus on the gross anatomy. I'm asking you to focus on the structures of the neuron and uh, what each type of neuron does, or each part of the neur neuron does more specifically. So uh, I have a little bit of information here. I'm gonna pull up a picture to show you in a second, just something that I downloaded so I could point at something with my mouse. So with a neuron, you're gonna have an input zone. That's where the messages come in. You're gonna have an integration zone where the messages are combined together. That becomes more important later when we talk about action potentials. And then if a message is fired, then you're gonna have a conduction zone that goes down the axon. You're gonna have the output zone where the message is gonna be released from that neuron. It's gonna diffuse across the synapse and then it's going to spread to the next neuron. So somewhere down here, I have a picture that I stole off the internet that's a little bit fuzzy here, but this is just a multipolar, the most common type of neuron. So what you'll see here is that we have dendrites. Now, dendrites are always part of the input zone. And with some types of neurons, the cell body would also be considered part of the input zone. So we have messages coming in, and then somewhere in here, we're gonna have an axon hillock where all those messages are gonna be integrated. More on that when we talk about action potentials. And then if there is an action potential, it's gonna be passed down the axon. It's gonna be propagated um, down this axon. Now notice that the axon is covered in this um, white tissue, this fatty uh, myelin sheath that helps increase the speed of the uh, message being conducted. And you'll also see the nodes of Ranvier that there are some portions of the axon that are not myelinated. And then the message gets down to the axon terminals and that causes neurotransmitter to be released into the synapse. And that neurotransmitter will then diffuse across the synapse and bind to the receptors on the next neuron. So the most common neuron by shape would be multipolar. So we have the cell body uh, towards the top and it has dendrites coming out of it. You have one long axon that's protruding out of the cell body and then you have axon terminals at the end. The most common type of neuron by function would be interneurons. So these are the neurons that uh, connect with each other and communicate information with each other. All right. Um, chapter three talked about action potentials. And so I think this is one where there are several steps in this process. So it could get a little bit confusing. Before we can think about an action potential, we have to figure out what's happening when our neuron is at rest. So it has not just fired and it is not about to fire, it's at rest. So um, when your neuron is at rest, it is about negative 65 millivolts. What that means is that the interior of the cell is about 65 millivolts more negative than the exterior of the cell. And this is the way the neuron likes it, it's happy, it's at rest. Also, when our neuron is at rest, we have our sodium potassium pump. Now, the sodium potassium pump is going to be pumping out sodium and pumping in potassium. And that's an important thing to bear in mind that the sodium is going to be building up outside of the cell. That's gonna become important again in a second. Also, when our neuron is at rest, we're gonna have potassium channels that are open. So potassium is able to come and go pretty much as it pleases, which is not true for sodium. Sodium is only gonna be able to open during the action potential. Otherwise, it's gonna be pretty much constantly being pumped out and being left outside of the cell. Potassium, on the other hand, is able to come and go as it pleases because there are um, these channels that are selectively permeable to potassium. So what will potassium want to do? Well, you have to think about the fact that the inside of the cell is negatively charged and potassium is positively charged. So electrostatic pressure says that opposite charges attract. 
which means that the positively charged potassium wants to get into the negatively charged interior. But you also have to think about diffusion. So the potassium wants to be evenly spread out between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. It doesn't want to be clumped in on top of itself. So we have a point where potassium finds a balance, where diffusion and electrostatic pressure are kind of equalizing each other. And that balance is usually around negative 65 millivolts. Now, that's what our neuron is doing at rest. But we know that there are messages coming in through the receptors and dendrites and possibly in the cell body. So some messages that are coming in might be hyperpolarizing messages. If a hyperpolarizing message is coming in, that's letting in negatively charged ions, like for example chloride ions. That's going to cause the inside of our neuron to become more negatively charged. So instead of negative 65, maybe we're at negative 70, negative 75. What that means is we're pushing our uh, internal charge farther away from threshold and making an action potential less likely to happen. On the other hand, some messages that are coming in are depolarizing messages. So these are going to be caused by excitatory postsynaptic potentials. Hyperpolarization is caused by inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Really, when we're talking about a postsynaptic potential, we're just talking about a message that's coming in um, through that, uh, those receptors, right? Now, with uh, depolarization, you have this excitatory postsynaptic potential, so you have positively charged ions that are coming into the interior of the cell. That's going to make the interior of the cell less negative and make action potential more likely. So threshold is somewhere around negative 40 millivolts. So remember at negative 65, we're resting, we're happy, but if we have enough depolarization and we get down to about negative 40, that's going to cause the action potential to start. So what happens is that around negative 40, that will cause voltage-gated sodium channels to open. Remember that the sodium has been accumulating outside of the cell this whole time because of that sodium-potassium pump. So what happens is that the change in the charge inside the cell causes the uh, sodium channels to open and the sodium is going to rush in for two reasons. One, because of diffusion. Sodium has built up outside of the cell, so it wants to come in because it wants to be more spread out, but also because of electrostatic pressure. So sodium is positively charged. The interior of the cell is negatively charged. It's not as negative as it used to be, but it is still negatively charged when this starts. It's around negative 40. That's still negative. So sodium is going to run to, ugh, ugh, I'll get there in a second. Sodium is going to want to rush in. So what happens is that enough sodium rushes in to cause the cell to briefly become positive inside. Now, when this happens, the sodium gates are going to close. They're only going to be open for a very brief period of time. And then that particular portion of the axon is going to say, okay, I'm done. And then it's going to move to the next portion of the axon, and the process is going to be repeated. So it talks here about action potential being propagated. Remember that at those nodes of Ranvier, you have those sodium channels. So that when the previous section of the axon has become depolarized and you have action potential, that causes the sodium channels on the next section to open. More sodium comes in and this process continues down the axon, jumping almost from node to node. So once the uh, action potential has moved on, then that previous section of the axon is going to be in a refractory period. At first you have an absolute refractory period where the sodium channels remember that they just opened and they're not going to open again for a very brief period of time no matter what you do to that neuron. And then afterwards you're going to have a relative refractory period where it is possible for the cell to fire again but it's more difficult to get it to fire. And that really goes back to the fact that the cell is trying to become negatively charged. So when the sodium rushes in, the interior of the cell becomes positively charged. And the interior of the cell does not want to be positively charged. The sodium gates close, so the sodium can't rush back out that way. It will be pumped out through the sodium-potassium pump, but also, in order to try to get back to our negative, we can push out, or I say we, the neuron, can push out the potassium ions because remember the potassium channels are pretty much always open. Potassium is also positively charged and so it's a lot easier for the cell to just push out a whole lot of potassium 
um, to try to get back to its negative charge. So for a brief period of time, the cell is working very hard to get back to that negative state. And because of that, we have a relative refractory period where the uh, interior of the neuron is actually a little bit more negative than it was to start with. Maybe it worked a little too hard to become negatively charged. But because of the sodium potassium pump, it will eventually get back to where it wants to be. All right, let me know if you have questions. Once again, this is just kind of a quick overview. All right, chapter four talked about ligands. So it was about neurochemistry. We said that a ligand is anything that binds to a receptor. And we have some endogenous ligands, and we think mostly about neurotransmitters there. But we also have some exogenous ligands. And so for the midterm, I want you to focus more on the exogenous ligands, so the effects of various drugs. Now. For the purpose of trying to make this straightforward, I organize these into prescription drugs and non-prescription drugs. And yes, I put marijuana under non-prescription drugs, sue me. Uh, we live in Mississippi, so that's, that's where it belongs here. Okay, so first of all, prescription drugs. So most of these drugs are gonna work at the synapse, but local anesthetics would be an exception here. I'm assuming a local anesthetic would be a prescription drug but I guess you might could get some over the counter. You get what I mean, okay? You, there's not gonna be a question on the test that asks whether a local anesthetic is prescription drug or not. This is just me trying to organize it to make sense. All right, stream of consciousness. So with local anesthetics, they work by blocking sodium channels. Remember that the sodium channels opening is what triggers the action potential. And so if we block that process, action potential doesn't happen and a neuron doesn't fire, which means that we would not feel pain in that particular area. So anesthetics don't work at the synapse. The local anesthetics, when I say anesthetics, I mean local anesthetics. Um, general anesthesia would work at the synapse. But local anesthesia is gonna block the sodium channels to cause action potential not to happen. Okay. And then we also talked about medication to treat psychotic disorders, particularly schizophrenia. Remembering that positive symptoms would be the addition of something that is unexpected, like, for example, hallucinations, delusions, disordered speech, that kind of thing. Negative symptoms would be the loss of something that is expected, so a lack of emotion or facial expressions or interest in uh, relationships, that kind of thing. So we started off with the typical antipsychotics, or the first generation antipsychotics, and they worked pretty much exclusively at D2 receptors, a particular type of dopamine receptors. And they were antagonists there, so they, block, they would bind to the receptor and block it so that dopamine would not be able to have its effect. So this did work to treat positive symptoms. However, it didn't help a whole lot with negative symptoms. And in addition to that, there were some uh, side effects here, some Parkinson's-like things that happen when we block dopamine a little bit too much. So then we moved on to atypical or second generation antipsychotics. And they're gonna also work on dopamine, but in addition, um, serotonin. So 5-HT here is the um, abbreviation for serotonin. So they're gonna be antagonists both for dopamine and serotonin. And they may be helpful for treating negative symptoms, but the research is a little bit mixed on that. They do tend to have fewer side effects, although side effects are still possible. Okay, then uh, the next three here we talked about is treatments for depression. So we said that MAOIs are, um, they are blocking the enzymes that break down monoamines. So you have these enzymes that after something like norepinephrine or serotonin or dopamine has its effect, then they can be broken down by enzymes and then taken back up for reuse. So what we're doing with the MAOI is we're blocking those enzymes so that the norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine are not broken down so they can have more of an effect. But the problem with MAOIs is they have some side effects and they have some dietary restrictions and um, there can be some blood pressure issues and things. So then we moved on to tricyclics and they block the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin. 
which uh, actually works pretty well. They're fairly effective. The problem with tricyclics is that they're not very specific. And when you have a more generalized effect, you also have side effects as well. So the side effects were something that we were concerned about, so we switched to SSRIs, which are probably the most commonly prescribed medications for depression, but they're also frequently uh, prescribed for anxiety as well. SSRIs like Zoloft, Prozac, Paxil, Celexa, etc. They're going to work by blocking the reuptake of serotonin. So as the name implies, selective serotonin, uh, because they are more selective, you might not get as much of an effect as you would from like a tricyclic, but that's also a good thing because that causes a person to have fewer side effects. Although there are still side effects associated with SSRIs. Okay, um, and then we talked about treating anxiety. So barbiturates and benzodiazepines are both anxiolytics. They're medications used to treat anxiety. Um, both of them work by increasing the effect of GABA, but barbiturates uh, were found to be dangerous because um, there was a very narrow therapeutic index where the dose required to cause a person to feel better was not very far away from the dose that is dangerous to that individual. So a person might have either um, accidental or intentional overdose with these. And then also what we saw is that they do tend to be addictive as well. So benzodiazepines, things like Valium, Xanax became uh, more popular and they are still fairly popular, but I do want to say that even though they are less dangerous than barbiturates, there is certainly still addiction potential um, with benzodiazepines as well, but they're both going to work by increasing the effect of GABA. And then we talked about opiates, so um, we might have something like codeine uh, or morphine where we have an exogenous opioid. We have a drug that was created to mimic endogenous opioids. So endogenous opioids are your body's natural painkillers, something like endorphins. On the other hand, um, morphine and codeine were created to mimic those and to bind to the same receptors and, and to cause similar effects, which would be uh, an analgesic, so it, it helps reduce pain, but then also it may cause a person to feel very drowsy, relaxed, cause a person to sleep, etc. Um, heroin is another drug that would fall in the opioid category, um, but that would not be a prescription drug as we discussed in class. Um, it is not legal in any case to prescribe heroin in the United States. All right. And then um, non-prescription drugs here. Uh, I put caffeine, first of all. Some of these drugs, when I say non-prescription, I wasn't really sure how to label these. I ended up obviously going with non-prescription, but I, I also thought about using drugs of abuse, but I didn't know if it would be offensive to you for me to put caffeine as drug of abuse, although many of us are addicted to it. But uh, with caffeine, the way that it works is that it blocks the effect of adenosine at autoreceptors. So remember that you have some receptors on the presynaptic terminal, so on the axon terminals of the presynaptic neuron. And the autoreceptors are there to try to gauge the um, there we go to try to gauge the amount of the neurotransmitter that's in the synapse. And so with adenosine, it's going to be released along with some of those feel-good neurotransmitters, like for example dopamine. And so adenosine would normally bind to the autoreceptor and tell it that there is enough of this neurotransmitter it can stop releasing it but caffeine blocks that process and then your body ends up continuing to release those feel-good uh, neurotransmitters. Marijuana is going to mimic endocannabinoids. So we talked about the fact that sometimes we find these receptors before we find the endogenous ligand that binds to them. So we knew that marijuana triggered these cannabinoid receptors, what we didn't know is where is the endogenous ligand. We wouldn't have a receptor if we didn't have something naturally that fits there. And so we talked about the fact that we have uh, located and have uh, identified some endocannabinoids that cause similar effects to marijuana. So sometimes individuals have kind of hallucinations, oftentimes they report feeling relaxed, more hungry, um, could help reduce pain perhaps, that kind of thing. Uh, marijuana is going to work by mimicking those endocannabinoids.
nicotine is a stimulant just like caffeine, cocaine, and amphetamines. So nicotine is going to uh, activate those nicotinic receptors for acetylcholine. And so because it is a stimulant, it will cause an increase in like, heart rate, blood pressure, that kind of thing. Um, also, sometimes people have reported that using nicotine or any you know, product that has nicotine in it um, causes a person to have less of an appetite. So sometimes people are concerned about quitting uh, using nicotine because they're worried that it might cause them to gain weight, which I would encourage you to, to consider the fact that the weight might be not as dangerous to you as the nicotine is. All right, anyway. Moving on. Uh, cocaine, uh, another drug of abuse that we talked about in class. Um, cocaine is going to work by blocking the reuptake of dopamine primarily, but then also serotonin and norepinephrine. And so it's going to cause this buildup of all of these neurotransmitters that help a person to feel good and to feel energized. And so you're going to have that high, but then you're also going to have a crash afterwards. And so remember that you can have these withdrawal symptoms after your body runs through the drug. There's no more drug in its system. And that can cause a person to want to use the drugs again just to reduce those withdrawal symptoms. And then the more you use a substance, then you can start to develop tolerance to it. So my message to you guys as as always is don't do drugs. All right. Uh, amphetamines. Amphetamines work in several different ways to increase the amounts uh, or the effects of norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. So on the one hand, it, it's going to actually resemble those uh, neurotransmitters. So it can um, bind to those receptors and activate them. But it can also block the reuptake of those neurotransmitters and I put distracts their enzymes. Uh, the further I got into this thing, the less specific I got. But the, the idea is that it causes those enzymes to break down the amphetamines instead of breaking down the neurotransmitter, which might allow the neurotransmitter to hang around for a little bit longer. So amphetamines can be a very powerful stimulant um, that should not be taken lightly, should not be taken at all. All right, um, finally, when we're talking about drugs, alcohol, we talked about the fact that alcohol does cause dopamine to be released, which can cause a mild stimulant effect at the beginning of consuming alcohol. And we also talked about the fact that dopamine is associated with addiction. So many drugs that are addictive do work on dopamine pathways. But we talked about the fact that alcohol will also cause a person to feel more relaxed. It's primarily classified as a depressant. It calms down the nervous system in a similar way to something like a benzodiazepine. So that's going to mimic GABA. A uh, couple of things to say here. First of all, we talked about this in class. Don't miss this question. No alcohol while pregnant or lactating. No amount has been proven safe. But then my uh, other thing to note here is that using substances can be dangerous. It's especially dangerous if you start mixing substances. So for example, taking alcohol and benzodiazepines or barbiturates um, can cause a synergistic effect that multiplies the effect of those drugs. So don't, don't combine drugs. Okay, I think I probably uh, taught you guys that in class. All right, so then as far as chapter seven goes, which was about development, I asked you to focus in on the six stages of nervous system development. So we have neurogenesis, cell migration, cell differentiation, synaptogenesis, apoptosis, and synapse rearrangement. So with neurogenesis, we start off with non-neural cells. So neurons themselves are not going to divide. So the cells that will eventually become neurons start out as these generic, non-specific, non-neural cells. They're going to be in the ventricular zone. And in that zone, these generic cells are going to start dividing by mitosis. So all I really want you to know about mitosis is that you start off with a parent cell that will end up producing two copies of itself. So the two copies will be identical to the original cell and identical to each other. So you start off with a parent cell that's going to produce two identical daughter cells. Now, some of those daughter cells will stay in the ventricular zone and continue dividing by mitosis. Some are going to migrate away to become nerve cells, which will either be glial cells or neurons. So once we have cells that are being produced in the ventricular zone, then some of them are going to migrate away 
these undifferentiated nerve cells, remember they have not yet turned into a particular type, are going to move along radial glial cells. So we had a picture that we showed in class. Essentially it looks like this nerve cell is crawling along this radial glial cell until it gets to its location and that migration is not only guided by radial glial cells but also by cell adhesion molecules that attract the neuron and help it end up in the right place. Once it gets to the correct location then that cell will differentiate into the type of cell that it's going to be. So what type of cell will it become? It really depends on two factors that we could break down into nature and nurture. It always comes back to nature and nurture in psychology. So with cell autonomous factors, we're talking about genetics here. So within our cell, we have DNA. It's going to have instructions. It's going to have genetics that are going to play a role in what type of cell it becomes. But also induction refers to the impact of the cells around it. So our cell will start to mimic the cells around it. It will pick up on the chemicals being released by the surrounding cells and um, that will cause it to be more likely to turn into the same kinds of cells as uh, are surrounding it. So once our cell has gotten to the right place, it's become the right type of cell, then we have synaptogenesis. So with synaptogenesis, we're going to have this explosion of connections between our newly differentiated cells. So the cells are going to uh, make connections and remember that synapse is going to be surrounded by a presynaptic membrane and a postsynaptic membrane. The presynaptic membrane would be the axon terminals, the postsynaptic membrane would be the dendrites. So axons are sprouting axon terminals and they're sprouting dendrites. So with both the axon terminals and the dendrites, as they're growing, the very tip of this projection is called a growth cone. And that growth cone is going to be covered in phyllopodia. So these are the little projections that are reaching out towards their destination and causing either the axon terminal or the dendrite to sprout. And how does it know where its destination is? How does it know which direction to grow in? Well, a few different things. Um, cell adhesion molecules, once again, are going to attract the phyllopodia. They're going to attract the axon terminals and dendrites so that they head in the right direction. But then we also have other chemicals kind of generally referred to as chemoattractants if they are drawing it closer or chemorepellents if they're pushing it away to prevent um, problematic connections that don't need to be there. So we have this explosion of connections that immediately afterwards is followed by apoptosis which would be selective cell death. Now remember that this is not a bad thing. We need excess cells to die. Our brain is very redundant. It creates more cells and more connections than are needed, um, but we need to get rid of those extras so that our brain can be more efficient and quite honestly so that it can fit in our skull. So a particular neuron will have death genes that are only expressed when that neuron decides that it is not necessary. And then when that happens, you will have a process that is triggered by calcium. So calcium will rush into the neuron. That calcium will then set in, pro set in motion a process where Diablo will be released. So Diablo, we have this very um, villainous name here. Well, the Diablo is going to go and bind to the IAPs. This would be the inhibitory uh, inhibitors of apoptosis protein, something like that. The point is, normally the IAPs are stopping this process, but when Diablo binds to them, they are deactivated and they can't do anything about it. So now the line of defense against apoptosis has been taken out, and that allows the caspases to come in and to break down the proteins in the cell so that it is destroyed. And then after we have selective cell death, then we're going to need to rearrange our synapses. So with synaptogenesis, we were only forming new synapses. With synapse rearrangement, we are getting rid of unnecessary synapses and we're also gaining new ones and an ongoing process that happens even when you're an adult, you're still making new connections when you learn something new. But with synapse rearrangement, we know that we need to get rid of some of these connections so that the connections that we have are more efficient.
And what it's going to be doing here is thinning the gray matter. So remember that the white matter refers to the myelinated axons. The gray matter is going to refer to um, the parts of the neuron that are not myelinated, so dendrites and axon terminals. Remember that those are the presynaptic for axon terminals, postsynaptic for dendrite. Um, membranes and so we're getting rid of those unnecessary parts and this is going to continue in a caudal rostral direction. Essentially what we're saying here is that we are going to end up pruning in the um, prefrontal cortex last of all and that is part of the reason why uh, your brain is not fully developed until mid-20s because this is a process that is ongoing. Okay. Chapter 12, we talked about issues related to sexual activity. What I want you to focus on for the midterm would be sexual differentiation for males and females. So we have a few different things to think about here, and there is a chart in your textbook, and it's also in your notes. Um, if I could find it, I could find it. I have the textbook open here. I can tell you what page to look on. If you have the textbook, it's on 385. But um, you also, if you don't have the textbook, it should be in your notes. So it's a chart that talks about genetic sex, gonadal sex, and phenotypic sex. So when it talks about genetic sex, we're talking about your chromosomes. Remember that females only have X chromosomes, so all eggs have X chromosomes. But then with males, they have X and Y, so some sperm will have X and some sperm will have Y. So dad is going to be the one to determine the sex of baby. So. The way that this works for a male individual is that if they have XY chromosomes, then there's one portion on the Y called an SRY gene that leads to the development of testes. Once the testes are formed, they're going to produce two hormones. They're going to produce anti-Mullerian hormone, and once again, I did not feel like I didn't have time to figure out how to put our two little dots on top of the U, okay? Maybe there's a way to do that really easily, but you know, I just didn't feel like doing that, and apparently I didn't feel like correctly spelling some things either. You guys just forgive me. All right, so that's not important. The point is, let me go back. XY chromosomes. So we have a Y chromosome. That means we have an SRY gene, and the SRY gene causes testes to form. The testes are going to produce two hormones, or anti-Mullerian hormone and testosterone. The anti-Mullerian hormone is going to cause the Mullerian system to regress, and testosterone is going to cause the Wolfian system to develop. So remember that an uh, embryo has all the parts necessary to become male or female. You start off with a genital tubercle that could become a clitoris or a penis. You start off with an indifferent gonad that could become a testis or well, two, so testes, uh, two indifferent gonads could become testes or ovaries. And then you also have um, these duct systems that are female if you're talking about Mullerian and Wolfian if you're talking about male. So if you are male uh, genetically, you have XY chromosomes, you have an SRY gene, you have testes, you have this AMH, anti-Mullerian hormone that causes the female duct system to disappear and then testosterone causes the male duct system to develop further. And then in addition, testosterone also is going to be converted to its more potent form, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, and that is going to finish um, this process with phenotypic sex. So what can you see on the outside? Um, and with phenotypic sex, we're talking about a penis in particular, um, also a scrotum. Uh, could also be considered part of this. So you have your um, genetic sex, you have gonadal sex, and you have, when I go to natal sex, I'm trying to highlight the testes here, and then you have your phenotypic sex, like penis. All right, now what about a woman? Women have XX chromosomes, so once again, that's the genetic sex. The gonadal sex for a woman is going to refer to ovaries. So the indifferent gonad in an individual with XX chromosomes is not exposed to this SRY gene, so instead of forming into testes, those gonads will turn into ovaries. Now, if they turn into ovaries, then we're not producing testosterone. So the Wolfian system will go away, the male duct system will go away. Also, did not turn into testes, so we don't have a lot of uh, AMH either. So the Mullerian system will develop because there was no anti-Mullerian hormone to stop that. And because there's no 
uh, testosterone, there's no DHT, the more potent form of testosterone. So you're not going to have a penis, you're going to have labia, vagina, that genital tubercle will become a clitoris. So essentially what we're saying is that this process is driven by the presence or absence of testosterone. Okay. And then our last section here uh, is about thirst. Now, depending on when you watch this video, we may or may not have talked about thirst in lecture yet. So hold on. If this um, does not sound familiar to you, um, we are going to talk about this in lecture. So two types of thirst. Chapter 13 is about homeostasis. There are two major topics in chapter 13. Thirst is going to be on the midterm. We're going to cover that before the midterm. And then hunger is going to be in the second section of the class. So it'll be on the final exam. So when we're talking about thirst, it's important to understand the intracellular and the extracellular compartments. So what we're saying here is that all of the liquids in your body, all the fluid, can be broken down into one of two categories. A lot of your fluid is inside of your cells. So when we say intracellular, we're talking about the fluid that is inside your cells. All the things inside are kind of suspended in this fluid. But we also have extracellular fluid as well. So this is the fluid outside of your cells. Um, pretty much falls into the categories of interstitial fluid, which would be the fluid in between the cells. And then you also have blood plasma. So in your blood, you have red blood cells and white blood cells, and they're going to be floating inside the liquid component of your blood, which is blood plasma. So you have intracellular liquid and you have extracellular liquid. However, fluids are kind of crossing back and forth between intracellular and extracellular compartments based on what your body needs. So also, in order to understand thirst, we need to understand diffusion and osmosis. So two related but slightly different processes here. We've already talked about diffusion a little bit. Diffusion is the spread of a solute. So solute is the term for something that is dissolved inside something else. And the something else that it's dissolved in is a solvent. So um, for example, if we're talking about thirst, the important, most important solute would be salt. And then the, um, the solvent that it's going to be dissolved in is going to be water. So with diffusion, if you have a container of water and you add salt into it, then that salt is going to spread out in the water eventually until the, sol the solute, the salt, is evenly spread out within the water, the solvent. That's going to be a natural kind of passive process, the spontaneous spread of the molecules. So the goal of diffusion is to cause uh, an equal level of concentration throughout. Okay? Now, osmosis is also interested in an equal level of concentration, but instead of the solute spreading out, we have the movement of the solvent. So remember in these examples, the solute would be salt and the solvent would be water. So in order to make this a little bit easier, there's a picture I'm going to show you guys in class if you haven't already seen this. Um, depending on when you watch this video. I'm going to be showing you a couple of these pictures. So here we have osmosis. We have this semi-permeable membrane and it's going to allow water to cross but it's not going to allow salt to cross. So in our first picture we have about equal concentrations here of water and salt. So everything's happy here. Now we add more water to one side. Now remember that the salt cannot spread out, but the water can. So what's going to happen is that the water is going to spread out until it's equal on both sides, and you're still going to have the same concentration on both sides of the salt. Um, but the water will be less salty because we've added more water into it, but we have the same concentration on both sides. Now, that's what happens when you add water. But what happens when you add salt? So if we start off here with our semi-permeable membrane that will allow water to move but will not allow salt to move, and we start off with an equal concentration of salt on, and water on both sides, but then we add salt to this side. Now, if there was no membrane here, then the salt would diffuse. The salt would spread out until it was equally distributed. But we have this semi-permeable membrane that will not allow the salt to cross. 
but what we want is to have a, the same concentration of salt on both sides. And the only thing that can cross is water. So what happens is the water will actually cross over and cause an equal concentration of the salt in the water. This side has more salt, so it needs more water. This side has less salt, so it needs less water. So in order to have this uniform concentration, the water moves. It's the only thing that can move. The salt can't move, so the water moves. And so it's actually defying gravity here a little bit. I don't know if you've seen Wicked. I'm going to resist the urge to sing. Um, but it's actually defying gravity a, a little bit here because it wants to have this uniform concentration. The salt can't move, so the water does it. All right, so this is going to be important for us to understand, especially our first type of thirst. So um, two different types of thirst, osmotic thirst and hypovolemic thirst. So osmotic thirst happens because of an increased solute concentration in extracellular fluid. So if we're talking about extracellular fluid, we're talking about the fluid outside of the cell, either in between cells or the blood plasma. And what we're saying is we have this increased solute concentration. Essentially, our fluid has become too salty. Now this is a problem. If you have too much salt in your system, Remember that your body wants to have equal concentration, just like in that picture I just showed you. So what your body wants to do is to draw in extra fluid so that you have the same concentration inside and outside. And if we're drawing fluid into our extracellular compartment, the only place we can get it from is the intracellular compartment. So if you have too much salt in your system, in your extracellular compartment, then your body will steal water from your intracellular compartments to try to balance that out so you have the right percentage of salt in your fluids. So there's a picture in here too somewhere. Give me a second. Here we go. Okay, so you see here with osmotic thirst, we have too much salt in our extracellular um, compartment. And so because of that, we're going to start drawing out the fluid from our intracellular compartment, and then that will help us to balance so that we don't have too much salt. The problem with that is now we have drained the resources from our uh, internal or intracellular compartments, and so we need more liquid. Now, how does this happen? Well, there are a variety of ways that it can happen, but you see this individual is eating pizza. So if you eat very salty foods, that will raise the solute concentration. You'll have so much uh, salt in your extracellular compartments that water will have to rush out of your intracellular compartments to balance that. So that might cause a person to feel bloated or might cause an individual to feel very thirsty because their body is driving them to replace that uh, loss from the intracellular compartment. This is also why you should not drink salt water or sea water. So you, you hear about being stranded on a desert island and you're, I say desert, somewhere, you're stranded on an island and there's no water to drink except for, not desert, I guess that doesn't make sense, does it? Anyway, the point is, if you're, you're on an island surrounded by the sea, you should not drink salt water, sea water, because it's just going to make you more thirsty. You fill up your system with this salty water, and that's going to cause it to draw out more water from your intracellular compartment and just make you more thirsty. So not a good idea. Okay, so you have this increase in salt. So then you have the intracellular fluid that comes rushing out to try to balance that. Now, you have these special neurons, they're called osmosensory neurons, and their purpose is to detect this type of thirst, osmotic thirst, and they're going to trigger a couple of things. So the osmosensory neurons are going to be found in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is kind of a theme throughout chapter 13 as being important for maintaining homeostasis, the right balance. So it's going to cause a couple things. One, it's going to cause a person to feel thirsty so that they will drink and replenish their intracellular compartment, but also it's going to trigger water conservation. So uh, it's going to cause the system to start trying to save water, decrease the urine output, that kind of thing. Okay, now with osmotic thirst, 
The problem is not that you lost liquid, it's that you gained salts. But with hypovolemic thirst, you've lost both liquid and salts. You, you just had a decreased volume of your extracellular fluid. So there's a picture of this here. So what's happening is we have lost fluids, and it ha I don't know why it has this individual gushing out of their foot. It could happen out of any number of locations, I suppose. The point is that this can happen with excessive loss of fluid. So we have some loss of fluid that's normal, that just happens throughout the day. So urine output, um, like when you breathe out, you lose a little bit of liquid, sweating, that kind of thing. Those are normal amounts, but what if we have uh, diarrhea or vomiting or excessive blood loss? This can cause a decrease in the volume of fluid, which will cause a person to feel thirsty. So the way that this works is this is going to be detected by these baroreceptors that are in your blood vessels. So when you have lost liquid, it will cause your blood pressure to decrease. The baroreceptors notice this, like our blood vessels are not as full as they used to be. They're not stretched out as much as they used to be, and that's going to uh, decrease the blood pressure. So what happens is that the baroreceptors recognize this, and then they're going to set in motion some things to try to solve the problem. One thing it's going to do is make you thirsty so that you can help replenish this. This is why when a person is sick, they need liquids, especially if you're sick of the stomach variety, vomiting, diarrhea, you need to replace liquids. But it's also gonna cause salt hunger. I don't know, maybe this is why we like to nibble on saltines when we feel sick to our stomach. This says constriction of blood pressure. That's not right. Constriction of blood, um, I guess blood vessels is what I meant to be putting here. Um, but just constriction of arteries, uh, etc. So what we're saying here is that to try to counter this problem, we've lost the fluid. So our blood pressure has gone down. So what we need to do is replace the fluid and the salts, but in the meantime, we need our blood pressure to come back up. And so one way we're going to do this is we're going to be constricting the arteries, the, the blood vessels, veins as well perhaps. And what that's going to do is that's going to increase blood pressure a little bit to get it back closer to normal. And then once again, water conservation is going to be um, important as well. Okay, so this has been a brief overview. Remember that you only need to focus on these topics for the midterm exam. But um, there may be some particular parts of these topics that I didn't cover in this lecture video. So I do recommend going back over your notes, and the textbook is a great resource as well. Let me know if you have questions as you are preparing, and I will talk to you guys in class.